Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Foresight's Biotech and Health Extension Group, sponsored by 100 Plus Capital. I'm really, really happy to have uh, Colin here today. Um, there is almost a week uh, that goes by without uh, not someone uh, basically trying to hunt me down about the extracellular matrix. Last night, I went to like a um, a Pillar VC uh, biotech uh, drinks here in San Francisco. They had like a decentralized drinks uh, based on their, their conference. And, and there are like two people uh, that uh, that talked to me about it. We had it as an undervalued area that uh, Joe betz pointed out in a um, previous biotech and health extension workshop that we had. And since then, a lot of people also in this group have been really working on like just trying to draw out like what are the different connections here that we're missing uh, and so forth and through that I'm really happy uh, that I got uh, to be introduced to you Colin thank you so so much for joining I think you're working on a uh, on a field that you know is, is is only going to get more popular I think um, in, in the next few years so thanks a lot for having your eye on it so early thanks a lot for joining us to discuss that field a little bit more we're really delighted to have you here I'm sure we have a bunch of questions uh, popping in but you'll be discussing aging and extracellular metrics I will be in the chat. I'm going to share more info about your bio here as well. Um, and I will try to uh, monitor questions at, as they pop in. Just a reminder to everyone joining, we usually run out of time at the end of this. So if you do want to get your question uh, uh, answered, if you want to make sure that it's uh, that is asked, then feel free to already drop it in the chat. Otherwise, after the presentation, feel free to raise your hand and we'll try to get to you soon. But yeah, thanks a ton for joining. Really, really excited uh, about this presentation. And uh, the stage is yours. I'll be in the chat. Thank you so much for uh, the kind invitation and the kind words. And uh, you're right. I mean, the extra matrix uh, gained a lot of attraction lately, um, but it's a very hard thing to solve. So it's uh, it's it's a mystery. It's pretty complex. You will see in my talk, and um, we try our best from the academic side to solve this. So all I'm going to present here is more from the academic side now. Um, so just to, I'm a assistant professor at ETH Zurich, but also just to declare my conflict of interest, I'm a co-founder of Avea. I'm at the advisory board of two startup builders, and I'm, you know, advise some long charity startups in this space. But all the work I present has nothing to do with this thing. So now I'm going to start with, you know, we know there are conserved interventions that can slow aging, for example, reduced insulin IGF-1 signaling, caloric restriction, reduced mTOR signaling. Um, um, sorry, I want to get the pointer, the laser pointer. So mTOR signaling, reduced protein translation, out in mitochondria function, or reducing germ stem cell numbers. And so... We know how these interventions actually improve cellular homeostasis, right? They improve DNA repair, epigenetic regulation. They help refold or um, help with the protein homeostasis in the, uh, in the ER and the mitochondria or inside the cell. However, we lack a solid understanding how proteins outside of cells, the exome matrix are actually repaired uh, and maintained. And so, Collagen is the most abundant protein in the exome matrix. And we just recently looked in mice. In mice, you know, the collagen make up 12 to 20% of the total proteins, right? So it's it's a major component even in, in, in whole uh, uh, organisms. And so basically there are two different kinds of exome matrix. One is this sheet-like structure called the basement membrane. Here you can see epithelial cell on, on top of it. And then down here is the connective tissue. You see all these collagen bundles. And there's a very nice illustration done by um, David Goodseltz, where here's the cell membrane, right? And then here you have the basement membrane collagens around here a little bit. Then you have lots of other crowded things. And then you have these huge, huge collagen bundles, these connective tissues. So, you know, in, in reality, you think there's always some loose proteins, but the reality looks like there's a very crowded environment and things will move around. And so tonight we're going to focus on the exome matrix uh, here. Now, what is happening uh, with the exome matrix? So, so some of the collagens are once synthesized and they stay in the exome matrix forever. Other ones are turned over and some of them are actually turned over by circadian rhythm, right? So day night cycles are collagens produced and degraded, for example, in your tendons, right? So basically, 
if a collagen is produced, this, uh, you know, the MRI is made, the synthesized, the secretion has to be integrated in their matrix. If something is broken with uh, collagens, then it has to be cleaved out, for example, metalloproteinases, and then internalized and integrated, right? And so this Romano of exome matrix is a process that works very well when young. For example, when you go into a gym, you train your biceps, your muscle will grow, also your exome matrix will grow, right? However, like any other process during aging, that declines, and uh, what we think is happening that these pro longevity factors will actually maintain this e cell remodeling for longer. Again, just mention what's happening with these exome matrix is collagens with aging, they become fragmented either to MMP's cleavage. There are um, sugars added to these, these are the advanced glycation end products, which then can start to crosslink, and this is stiffening. So basically with aging, what you have is a stiff exome matrix, but the mechanical weaker because of these fragmentations, right? So the mechanics is not working. And also there are other proteins that just accumulate there, and that's not, I'm not going to talk today, but we also, you know, had uh, amyloid beta secreted in the exome matrix, and it's in there, and we know how it's remodeled out. Um, so, you know, the thing is that, you know, a faulty ECM leads to actually age-related diseases. And that was a big surprise when, when we looked at this. So when we look at, you know, all the exomatrix chains and we looked at SNPs that are associated with human diseases. So there, we found 333 ECM genes that had SNPs associated with, with human diseases. Of course, most of them were these connective tissue diseases, right, or common diseases. But then what you appreciate here in this light green are these age-related diseases. And so these are all these dots. So that was a big surprise. And we're going to soon put this out as a publication. The other thing we have already published is actually when we look, for example, at different collagens or um, uh, filbrins and other things, sometimes, you know, one collagen, for example, collagen 21A, has over 200 human phenotypes, which is actually crazy how much, you know, one protein can influence how many phenotypes. And so um, basically, you know, what we think is going on that during development, you can handle actually a little bit of faulty ECM, but then during, during aging actually, or, you know, during normal physiology, that becomes problematic, right? If it's functional there. And there's a real medical need because there's a therapeutic gap for ECM integrity. At the moment, there are about eight targets in the exomatic target in 27 clinical trials, and most of them against fibrosis and cancer, right? And of course, um, there could be much, much more done seeing the implication in different diseases. Now, what we first done, um, that was actually with uh, Tinka um, Vidovic. She's also in the audience, such as so. Um, she, uh, but what Tinka da, did actually, she defined the human molecular disease network of the ECM. And so basically, we know all these um, collagens and proteoglycans and the exome matrix that connect inside. And so she mapped all those pathways that are regulated either in disease, but also surprisingly, they also regulate uh, uh, longevity at the same time. And most of the transcription factors not only. Um, change, you know, fibrosis or um, osteoarthritis, for example, but also change the ECM signaling, right? The regulation of flexible matrix homeostasis. And so some of those transcription factors like FOXO and nf copper beta NRF2, uh, you recognize as actually longevity transcription factors. And they actually um, cover a good amount by chip data, good amount of flexible matrix genes. And so that led to actually the question like, what is actually a youthful and healthy ECM. Now, to address this, we, we took a systems biology approach, and um, that was done actually by Alexander Napa, who defined the human matrisome. So the matrisome are all these proteins that are outside of the cells. So the core matrisomes are the things that form the exome matrix, like collagens here, or um, protoglycans, for example. And then the matrium associate things are either things that associate like growth factors onto the matrix or things that regulate the exome matrix or remodel the exome matrix. And so in humans, there are around 1,027 matrisome genes. And then also we mapped in, in with our lab, with Alexandra Napa, we mapped it there around 719 extra uh, matrisome genes. Now that gives us the first thing where we actually looked like, you know, if we cover now all the proteins that's, you know, outside the matrisome, like what's their phenome looks like across species. So in humans, 
all the phenotypes, so the phenotypic space, the phenome is around 7.6% of the matrisome covered, right? So it's a big coverage. If you co connect, get them all together, it's like 11,666 phenotypes are linked to matrisome genes in human, mice, zebrafish, Drosophia, and sea organs, right? Now, there are lots of expected phenotypes came out, right? For example, development, morphological changes, structure changes. But, you know, the surprising thing here, again, ECM phenotypes included immune system, stress resilience, which is important for aging, and, of course, age-related phenotypes. Now, what, what really struck us when we looked at this, and so it's probably too small to read, but I want to point out, so we have human, mice, um, zebrafish, trosophia, and sea elegans. And so, for example, if we just focus on this green area, these are muscle tissue, muscle tissue phenotypes seen in human, in mice, in uh, zebrafish, so there are a, a lot, right, in Trosophila and in sea organs. And of course, for example, altered body size, you see this in humans, mice, zebrafish, Trosophila and sea organs, right? So there's in a different range, but they all come together. So meaning that, you know, there might be a shared overlap with the, with the phenome. And we see this also with the top targets, right? For example, um, collagen 11A1 in six species has, for example, phenotypes and body size and bone, bone morphology, right? And we can really nicely map this out and, and it's beautiful. But that led actually to the idea. So Sio starts at the idea, but can we actually go across species and then look how this phenotype match and learn from each another species? So for example, if you look at... Um, I want to focus here on the collagens, for example. If you look at the collagen, collagen 5A, 2-1A, uh, collagen 1IA, collagen 3A1, right? So they're all interconnected depending on those phenotypes, alter, uh, alter body size or muscle tissue phenotypes, development phenotypes. You can map do the same map for mice. So they're different, different links. And then and then for, for zebrafish. So maybe, you know, you can fill in missing links that either you learn from zebrafish back to humans or human, what you learn from humans back to zebrafish if you want that, right? And so what I want to take you here is actually the inter, you know, the interchangeability of these in phenotypic interactions are pretty, pretty substantial. So we learn actually from model organisms a lot for humans or vice versa. So that's the first take-home message I want to give you. The second one is, one thing that was postulated in the field for a long time is saying that each cell type or each tissue produces its own extra matrix, right? So a fat cell, for example, produces a different extra matrix than, than a skin cells, right? And so to check whether that's really true, right? Can actually can we actually identify cell type just based on the extra matrix who went to single uh, sequencing data? And that was a collaboration with uh, Patrick Job, where they uh, looked at chick and mouse uh, limb development. And here we only show, show the mouse one. So you see this typical T-SNP uh, um, plots, uh, you know, different embryonic stages. And what you can appreciate is what we compared are random genes to transcription factor to core matrisome genes, right? And so the, the core matrisome actually outperforms the transcription factor of random genes, meaning that we can actually, you know, based on, on the gene expression of a single cell gene expression, we can say what cell type it is and also what, what cell stage is because that changes during development. And the astonishing thing is if you take the whole transcriptome from the single cell analysis data, the core matrisome is only 2%. So in this 2% actually is a lot of information in there. Uh, we don't know how it connects, but it's, you know, it gives the idea that actually then from the composition of the extra matrix, there, you know, there is a lot of information in there about cell type and cellular state, right? Or health and disease. And so that's why I coined the, the term matriotype which is matrisome and, and what, what type it is that's uh, the, prototype that Rudy Elbersort had defined the prototype and you know I just connected this together and this is basically the snapshot of ECM composition associated or caused by a phenotype or physiological state like health, disease, aging and longevity and that gives actually a, a window into like either cell identity or cell health or what's happening right because whatever happens inside the cell is communicated out and vice versa. 
So this um, was collaboration with um, Eamon Williams and was from the Rudy Albasol lab. And what they actually have done, they, they this is a crazy experiment. They um, had um, 2,157 individual mice. And so they're BXD mice. So they have different genetic backgrounds. They had them either high fat diet, a high fat diet or normal chow diet. And then they, they watched like 1,500, about 1,500 naturally die. And they also took the livers. And with the livers, they uh, did, you know, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics in massive data accumulation, right? But the cool thing is now, if you have all this data on for systems biology, you can do again go for like um, covariance, build gene networks, and then try to find causal inference. And one thing I want to highlight, and that's the reason why I was uh, on that paper, is because they found either with the transcripts during aging, there's lots of extra matrix uh, changes besides mitochondria and, and oxfos. And also on the protein levels, and, and that's in mouse liver, right? They saw a lot of um, extra matrix changes um, via felt the here or focal tissues, right? And then if you look for the matrisome, you see actually on the MLA or the protein level, there's uh, an enrichment during old age, right? And so that is also shown here. And then we basically have these two candidate genes uh, where we tested whether they have any um, functional relevance for longevity. And basically both of them um, block the longevity in, in C. elegans. So then from basically from association or correlations, we went down to for causal inference. And so that also tells you, you know, that the matrisome itself uh, holds a lot of information also for aging. Um, our group did this a little bit further. We compared all the different um, proteomics and transcriptomics that are out there with these BXD mouse cords. And what you can do then, you can actually look at the ones that are shorter lived to ones for 200 days to ones that live 900 days, right? And you can you can plot, you know, the MR level, for example. And only like two genes came out, core seven and set um, genes that correlated nicely. And that's from dish and tissue. And basically what you could see that with core seven, the proteomics and the liver data set, they actually, the more core seven you have, the longer the mice will live, right? But you also can appreciate that is different for other tissue, either for the eye or the kidney, right? So it's it's extremely complex. Now, what is core seven? That's a coronin, which is cytoskeletal remodel. And cytoskeletal remodeling actually, you know, when you tear around here in the exome matrix, then, you know, Interquins will uh, signal down the forces to the side of the skeleton, which then wiggles down the nucleus, which changes gene expression. So what we are thinking that, you know, this would be a like mechanical transductive mechanism, right? Now we thought, you know, this is interesting, the, this major type, well, you know, can we actually use it for truck discovery? And so basically um, what Seal has done that he used the, the GTEx data you know, different tissue, brain, lung, skin, and, and kidney. And he defined and stratified the that um, gene expression of these different tissues by age, right? And so basically look then for the exome matrix gene expression. And, and so what he defined then was, you know, an old and youthful matriotype, so to speak, right? And so basically what we were thinking then to do is to... Um, then see whether we can use that one to predict any drugs. And so the first step we've done, we just uh, take, you know, all these different drugs with gene expressions are, are known and looked um, for drugs that are known to increase lifespan in any model organisms. And there were 37, uh, 47 of them. Now the surprise was that 41, you know, uh, over 9% um, actually changed the matrisome and exome matrix uh, uh, significantly. And that was actually when, when I saw this data, I almost fell off my chair because, you know, I didn't expect that such a huge implication there, right? And so I thought, okay, well, maybe we are onto something and we could use the exome matrix gene signature, the matriotype, to predict novel drugs. And that's exactly what we've done. So we predicted 180 um, drugs that might increase the lifespan. Um, and we tested those ones in CR against, and I think out of, we tested 24 and almost all of them uh, worked. And so that's a really nice pipeline then to figure out these um, longevity drugs. And I'm, I'm not going to go into it because it's published, but we, we're doing two follow-ups uh, for that one. The first one was actually then a collaboration with uh, Mebel Biochemistry 
where we had this one travel bell and we gave it to 32 um, subjects with some damaged skin, um, 200 milligrams daily for two months. And then, you know, we saw that the skin uh, moisturization is the, and the density improved after, after those two months, right? So it looks like not only it works in, in C. elegans, but also has, you know, for, for skin aging, just this, as an oral supplement. The second one that actually came out was really surprising was uh, chondroitin sulfate, uh, which, which is a known supplement and it's heavily used. And so I found this uh, person very interesting because chondroitin sulfate, you have the, on these proteoglycans, right? You have this chondroitin sulfate change, which is chondroitin sulfate is just, it, it's, it, it's, you know, it, it's a sugar. But it's known that, you know, chondroitin sulfate can block inflammation. But uh, what we think our data now shows is actually, uh, you know, uh, also activating exome matrix gene expressions to recognize for modeling. Of course, if we feed chondroitin sulfate, it increased the lifespan of C. elegans. So we, we have um, two-day adults, right? So their past development, we feed them chondroitin sulfate. The black time is the, the water field control. And then the blue line is controlled in sulfate. So it increases lifespan. Now, why I think this is interesting because you know there are these big cohorts, for example, the vitamins and iceberg core, the VTEL, that um, looked at 7,700, um, yeah, 77,000 people, right, of the age from 50 to 76. And they had two follow ups one was after five years, and the other one after 6.8 years, right? And so chondroitin sulfate users that took chondroitin sulfate four times, uh, a week, four days a week for three years, um, you know, they had, you know, a 0 0.83 and a 0 0.86 um, uh, multivariant adjusted HACE ratio. What that means is actually they had a 17% and a 14% decrease in risk of total mortality. And then in the second study where, you know, that was you know, 16,000 people, uh, 8.9. You follow up, that was chondroitin sulfate together with glucosamine because glucosamine is also a sugar uh, also in the exome matrix. And so sometimes users use both of them. In that study, actually, the uh, multi-trusted hazard ratio is 0 0.73, which actually mean, means a, a 27 decrease in uh, total uh, mortality, which you know makes it pretty interesting. And now we're really trying to figure out how that works on the molecular levels. Like, how, how, you know, what are the mechanisms? And so, so that brings me to the point that, you know, we can use exomatrix homeostasis or, or the, or the matrix type for truck discovery. That's one thing, but as an academic, I'm highly interested how it actually works. Like how these changes in exomatrix are mechanistically um, sensed. And so as we know that genes are expressed, the, the calls are laid out there, there's a feedback inside the cell, right? For this, um, collagen remodeling and we think long charity interventions uh, just that but how is that actually happening how is this feedback and this interaction uh, working so how did we study that ecm homeostasis to an aging in vivo right uh, we use elegans because um it's basically um you know it oops oh, the video is not working but it basically you know age is similar us, but within three weeks the genes are 46 percent conserved and it's transparent right we can in in vivo monitor the changes of exomatrix proteins uh, alive in these animals. Previously, I also have shown that, um, you know, if you look at long-lived animals, here's like in, in red, the dub doubling in lifespan, if you knock down key collagens that completely suppress their, uh, their longevity. Furthermore, when we also shown that to all expression, certain collagens actually sufficient to increase lifespan in, in C. elegans. Now, uh, we looked now, we did the systems biology approach. We looked at all MRs changing. We see collagens actually decline with, with aging shown here. Um, similar on the protein nodes and de novo synthesis and actually metal proteins are upregulated in aging. We can also follow these um, uh, proteins, these collagens in the matrix of C. elegans and some of them are actually uh, made and then actually remodel out of the exome matrix during the age of C. elegans. Some are just once made and they stay forever in there, and some actually just increase. And that you know, we sorted all this out. But to 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 shorten this whole thing, basically what we've done, we did longitudinal PCR proteomics. We did a huge genetic screen, and we lifespan more than fifty five thousand C elegans. And all these things pointed to one structure, and this is called the hemidesmosome. Which, if you have the C elegans here, these hemidesmosomes are right by the muscles, and so. We have the cuticle, the cuticle up here, 
Then the skin with the hemidesmosomes go through, and this is the base of the membrane to the muscle. So it's a forced construction. The animals, the muscle pulls here to the exoskeleton all the way through. So it is a huge structure, right? And everything pointed to that structure. So why would the hemidesmosomes to be important? But the first thing was like to figure out like, okay, that means that, you know, mechanical changes could change gene expression. And to show this actually in CR against basically what we made, we made the chamber where we have CR against under no pressure and green should be the collagens. And you see almost no green, but you put them under pressure for uh, 72 hours, you see the green lining up. So the collagen expression is induced by simply pressuring the worms, right? And we quantified this here. Now, this is pretty cool because we can use this system and then look for factors that could suppress that. And so again, we have un animals under no pressure, pressure is in increase. And if we knock down YAP1, we completely suppress this increase. Now, YAP1 is a transcription co-activator known in the main system to read out the stiffening of the exomatrix, for example. And um, here we show it also works in C. elegans. Now, the important part is here, when we increase the lifespan of C. elegans shown here with F2 on the eye, instead of reduced insulin reaction one signal, this huge increase in lifespan is basically planted in, in a mutant that, that lacks CYAP1, for example, right? So the suggestion is not only required for depression-induced collagens, but also required for longevity. And then the most interesting part is uh, the yeah, we tag the up one with GFP, and if it's under no, you know normal conditions, nice in the cytoplasm, but then under longevity conditions like the DAF2 RNAi, we see it goes to these hemidesmosomes, right? And we can quantify this where we took this WAP beyond WAP10 and cherry, which is you know in between, and we found that YAP1 is right here. So this is WAP10. This is YAP1, you see this yellow one, this really nice co-localization. So basically what we think is going on is that under normal conditions, right, there's lots of force construction going on and YAP1 is here to, to monitor this. Now, under certain conditions, right, if things go wrong, YAP1 would go into nucleus and activate gene transcription. And so basically we put this all together and it looks like a very complicated model. And we, we did this together with engineers, but basically these hemidesmosomes are, you know, not only the set point, but also the sensor. The deviation is read by YAP1, which then changes the collagen expression, the ECM production, and that changes the matriotype. And there are feed negative feedback loops and positive feedback loops, right? And so mechanical changes to change the biology up there. Now, this is a model actually that was proposed by um, Jay Humphrey, and it's used actually for the blood vessel, right? See, again, it's also a tube. So in blood vessels, you have lots of shear forces, and it's a similar model there but not, of course, with the molecular thing, just, just the way the sensor and everything works. Now, basically what we've shown you here is that besides, you know, cell signaling, mechanical transduction coordinates longevity, right? So it's an ECM, ECM, or ECM cell homeostasis. So the question we had, what is this feedback loop? We found out these are the semidesmosomes in uh, year one. And so with that, I want to thank, of course, my lab was doing all the hard work um, day and night working with uh, on, on different projects, and I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so, so, so much. Uh, this was, yeah, this was a lot uh, to digest and um, and people have been digesting already. <laughs> in the chat. Um, so I'm going to jump right into questions, if you don't mind. Um, sure. I think that there is a ton of questions. Um, so maybe we'll start from the top. And uh, and this is also time, you know, feel free to raise your hand uh, in case you don't want to put yours in the chat. And I'll mosey my way down the chat, and then I uh, will get to questions by raised hand. And so the first one was from uh, Abdul Kader, and then we have Priyan queued up. Uh, shall I ask the question? Yep, yes. you have one all the way up there. Uh, I can also read it out in case you don't have it handy. Yeah, so my first question is about the organization, you know, of the extracellular matrix. Uh, I'm struggling with the fact uh, whether it is mainly a bottom-up approach or a top-down approach. So meaning a self-organization of the ECM uh, by the, its molecules, uh, which will be the bottom-up approach, L, or actually the cells uh, uh, actively changing and designing and engineering 
uh, uh, mainly that UCM uh, through a but uh, through a top down approach. That would be my first question. Yeah, so I think it's 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 both, and I, I give you an example. So if you take you know the simplest example, a reductionist approach, right? If you take cells and put them into cell culture, they keep producing collagens, right? And uh, the simple thing is you just crowd it with high molecular sugar. You crowd, put that. And so this, uh, when the cells secrete the collagen, they stay there around the, the cell membrane. If that's happening, within a couple of days, they will start forming exome matrix. And then a couple of days later, they will start remodeling exome matrix. So if you take a skin cell, you can make in, 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 this, in the cell culture, you can make an exome matrix that gets remodeled, right? Or a fat cell, and it's a different matrix. And so you can imagine now, if that that's your cell autonomous thing, right? They will build and they remodel the matrix. They know the inside out signaling. Now, if you then be not only one cell type, but you have multiple cell types, and usually like one cell type secretes the matrix for another cell type and vice versa. So it makes it much more complicated. So it's a multi-complicated problem there in, in, in the tissue. Um, do, do you think that uh, one approach takes over uh, in aging like... Uh... Uh, more than the other is that is that organization uh, organizational approach uh, being affected uh, uh, through aging? Yes, and so I think you know there's lots of entropy anyways going on in down aging, right? And and this signaling goes wrong in the sense. So if you think of about the matrix, right, and the cell pulls on it and feels how how strong it is, right? So this is the mechanical sensing there. Now, if you have either cross-linking, you think it's much stiffer, right? And the cell can change depending on the stiffness or tries to remodel the extra matrix. And now if you have the cross-links there, then it sends out metal proteinases, but the metal proteins cannot cleave there where the cross-links are, and you cleave somewhere else and it makes that part weaker, right? And so it starts spiraling down that it will keep producing and, and uh, the metal proteases and, and degrading this whole thing, right? So it's, it's like a vicious cycle once it started. It's a it's a vicious cycle. Okay, I wonder also about the interaction between exosomes and ECM. Uh, you know, did you study that? No, that would be wonderful to study. I haven't I haven't looked at it that yet. No, <laughs> still. Yeah. My last question then is about uh, drugs that may induce aging. Existing drugs that may induce aging through the ECM mechanism. Do you know of such drug ex, uh, drugs that do that? Yeah, it's, it's called sugar. <laughs> uh, sugar is not a drug, with all due respect. Yeah, no, I don't know exactly which drug could that, you know, anything that, you know, tries type process. I don't know the try direct targets there. I haven't, I haven't looked at drugs that would induce aging. You know, I'd rather look for drugs that could slow aging, right? Okay. Um, okay. Thank <laughs> you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Quirin, you already started with your question, so go for it. You know, I, I mean, you know, uh, you, you answered a lot of my questions that I wrote earlier in the course of your lecture, so that's fantastic. So I guess the, the one thing I want to suggest that you might talk about briefly, I'm sure you know much more about it than me, but the, arguably the greatest marvel of biology, or certainly one of them, is the developmental process of multicellular organisms from the single cell, you know, embryonic state to the full organism. And is it not the case that it is the extracellular matrix that essentially drives the structural formation, development, and differentiation of the, of the tissues? And can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I'm super biased. I would say yes, because I, <laughs> that's what I study, right? And, but the example that comes to my mind would be, for example, if you take a stem cell and you put them onto a a stiff surface, right? It will start to differentiate, say, you know, more in a muscle cell, and on a so soft surface, will differentiate in a fat cell, right? So it's uh, it's it's basically what you know, whatever is laid before from other cells, then the next stem cells will also be determined where it goes, right, for the tissue generation and that kind of sense. Right? Isn't this, as I understand it, what happens is kind of in some cases, like certain cells cells migrate along the ECM detect certain signaling molecules, differentiate, then emit other signaling molecules that latch onto the ECM so that the next cells that pass figure out what they're supposed to do. 
Yeah, and th th that's true, and it's super complicated, right? And it blows your mind if you start thinking too much about it, <laughs> how how everything even functions, right? But like, yes. <laughs> yeah, as I said in the comments, synthetic biology has a long way to go. So cool. Okay, we have a hand up already. Larry, if you want to go for it. Yeah, yeah, hi, Colin. A, a great presentation, and you're all really courageous, I think, working with the extracellular matrix. It's, it's a very difficult thing to uh, to understand. I know, you know, someone worked, did earlier with HIV and things like that. I mean, the thickness of the HL, of the extracellular matrix and sometimes really drastically uh, influence the infectivity of the virus. The viruses seem to get, you know, deterred by thick extracellular matrices. So it's, it's, it's I, I think it's a really important thing. The other thing I was going to ask about was the chondroitin sulfate. I mean, it does seem to have real activity, but it has really no bioavailability. So I was, I was just wondering, is it, it's really immunogen, is it somehow modifying the immune response? Do you see, you know, in, 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 in patients, I know with arthritis and things like that, of course, a lot of this is driven by an aberrant immune response. C. elegans, I mean, I don't know anything about the immune system and C. elegans, if, if there is any, um, you, you know, but but it is is some of the action the the, the positive because it does seem to sometimes have a real effect on things like arthritis and things like that. I mean, glucosamine, you know, may be a starting material for synthesis, but but I mean, uh, and I know the marine chondroitin sulfate seems to be better than mammalian, at least you know the little bit that I know about it. Um, did you have any evidence that there is some aberrant immune responses going on directed at them? Um, these extracellular metrics, chondroitin or heparin or, or, or things like that, that, um, you know, you see. Yeah. You ask all the right questions there. So, um, Cialgans for the immune response, right? Cialgans has only, it doesn't have an adaptive. It only has innate immune, right? A system. And so, and also it doesn't, it lacks NF couple beta, which, you know, is, you know, suppressed by chondroitin sulfate in a sense. So basically. What, it, what does it lack? What does it lack? What did, was it? You said it lacks and that's couple better. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And and the adaptive, yeah. And so basically, you know, there when Cialgans, what we see is a clear remodeling of the extracellular matrix. Right, chondroitin sulfate promotes um, collagen synthesis that are usually downregulated during aging. So that's one pathway, right? So now, I mean, the, the astonishing thing is there's so many clinical trials done with it. So it's super safe, right? You know, it might get to target or it doesn't get to a target depending on, on the study, but it has been used and seemed to seem to work, right? Um, and so we done actually now, we tested in mice, we, we fed it in uh, 20 months old mice and we see some improvements and you're trying to figure out now how this mechanistically work in old mice. And I, I don't know yet, we're still analyzing the data, but you know, one, one, one thing is with the immune system and we work with another guy, um, Klaus Eyer at ETH, where we do actual microfluidics and, and single cells, and they look at the immune response and, you know, trying to see whether controlling sulfate would modulate a LPS induced, you know, um, IL-6, yeah. for example, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, even, and, yeah. Yeah, uh, and so, and, and we're still in the middle of doing this experiment, sure, so I sure. can't say yet yeah. uh, where it's yeah. going, but we, we're trying to figure out, so give us, you know, a couple of months and then right, we'll right. It Yeah, whether it's that. macrophage differentiation, it's having an effect on with M2 or whether it's, you know, suppressing that. And again, things like TGF beta really kind of induce a lot of bad fibrosis and things and like one, that. One, one of my favorite one that, you know, was actually, it changes the microbiome. Yeah. At least yeah. No, the microbiome could, could have a yeah, have a big effect on it. Yeah. No, you're yeah. Right. So it could be just like yeah. the flip side of hundreds of thousands of you know clinical trials, and we know it's safe. Is of course that we know it's not a magic bullet either, right? People have been on it for decades. They're not all rejuvenated or anything. Yeah. I mean, does a magic bullet exist? I mean, it, no, no, but, but it does exist. seem they have some effect with arthritis or something, Carl. You, you know, with, with severe arthritis. I mean, it. Uh, it, it it does seem to mediate that a little bit, whether it's, you know, inducing T regs or help getting a better microbiome. I, I I don't know, you know, or changing macrophage differentiation somehow in, in, in the, in the, um, cause the intestines are really your, you know, center of immunity in many senses, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John, you're next. And then we go back into the chat. 
Hi, a very nice presentation and um, a very important subject. I have a couple of related questions. My understanding is that there are quite a few collagen crosslinks caused by glycation, but the more, most important ones are the ones that are long lived and can contribute to aging. And my understanding is that there are predominantly two of those. One is called glucose pain and one is called alpha diketone. Although there has been some um, controversy over whether alpha diketone actually exists because it's very hard to isolate from samples. And uh, so I wonder if, if my assumption on that is correct. And then my follow-on question is, have you looked at um, ALT711 or allegibrium and its ability to um, dissolve or break the alpha diketone crosslinks? All right. Um, so I must say we, we only touch these things on the surface um, in a sense. So there are different species between, you know, from these glycation end products in in humans or in mice or in rats. So there, there's there's difference already there. And also which one is the most dominant, predominant one that changes. So I'm I'm not sure what the latest verdict is. Now for these glycation breakers, um, they worked really nice in mouse models, but then failed, as you know, in in, in the clinical setting. At the moment, we're trying to get, so what we're trying to do is always try to get an experimental handle. And so the first one we tried to test these things was actually using C-Algans because believe it or not, but there are also, you know, things coming, crossings coming up, but we never were able really to get the experiments to work. And so that, you know, f fell apart. But what we do actually use this old uh, measurement called tandem tail breakage assay, where basically from the mouse or the rat, you take out the tandem out there, right? And so it's almost pure collagen. And so the more cross-linked the tandem is, the longer it takes it to break, right? And so now there, we, we do different drugs, and we recently have tested rapamycin, for example. And what we done, we gave, that was a collaboration with uh, Marcus Rick, um, we gave the mice, uh, 20 months old mice, rapamycin or dietary restricted them. Um, uh, and then, you know, I think a couple months later, we looked whether that changed then the, the clash, the, the breakage, right? Uh, how well the break. And so there was, there was no reversion. So that means that was not remodeled out due to uh, those two drugs. It just slowed down the accumulation there. Um, My thought is that perhaps um, working with longer lived animals and human tissues might give us uh, results that are more relevant to human aging than yeah. C. elegans or even mice, which have much shorter lifespans. Yeah, I would I would love to get my hands on 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 these kind of tissues. The question is what what to use, right? And then how how you know I mean you can go and use cadaver right and that was been in the seventies a very nice study from I think the diaphragm where they took this out and you see how biochemically if you try to digest it how nicely it increases right and they were able to, like this 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 linear increase they saw really nicely but then how you start um, testing this I would love to I would love to know to have some experimental handle to test all these uh, ideas. Do you have access to um, knee replacement or hip replacement surgery um, collagen? I could, I could get, and then you would do this ex vivo, you're thinking? Yes, yes. To do the kind of like the, the rat tail stretching experiment that, that or you might, yeah look at that and see what happens ex vivo as, as one possible way to do it. Yeah. And so, okay. So we, uh, once I wanted to do a clinical trial where we actually use uh, deuterium, we could actually, those patients before they have the operation, one or two months, if they want to participate, mm. would give deuterium and you would see the turnover, right? And maybe they could also do some, some drugs there. Right. And so you, like yeah. for one or two months, and then you would, you know, you would get the tissue and see then the in vivo effects of that one. It, it's a little bit hard to to control, but at least that was the closest thing in in that direction. But you know, setting that would be like great. That. Are you are you close to being able to do that? Do you have permission from um, the authorities or from the surgeons? 
uh, no, not yet. This is all like uh, still on paper. <laughs> well, I wish you luck in, in pursuing that. I think it's very fruitful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, John. And next one we have Giamo. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, hi, yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, um, I, I guess I had uh, two questions, which were, uh, like, I guess, uh, pretty simple, but, um, well, I, like, one was just clarifying, like, the study that we were discussing in the chat that uh, sh showed, like, 23% decrease in mortality. Like, we weren't sure if that was on humans, so I guess, like, asking whether <laughs> it was or not. And, and the other, like, just, like, whether you could give, like, some intuitive explanation of why this sort of in ECM uh, changes like could actually affect aging because I, I didn't get like an intuitive picture like for example like what mortality causes uh, could it be associated with if you have some idea um, so yeah the first one so these are um, from two cohort studies right and again these are just association right so just people either taking chondroitin sulfur by himself or just chondroitin sulfur with um, glucosamine right Statistically looking, they have just a lower um, hazard ratio, right? And so that's why if you calculate that backwards, I think with the controlled and so forth and um, to glucosamine is 27% uh, lower risk of, of dying, right? But again, these are such association. It could be also be that those people take better care of themselves. I mean, it's multivariate mm -hmm. adjusted, so you try for everything, but there could be something else what they do, right? That could lower their risk of dying, right, basically. And that's why, you know, it's it, these associations are great because it gives you the first hypothesis, and then you have to really go into to see how that's mechanistically worked, right? And so we either choose the organs to test this, whether that's even possible, and then go, in, and go into mice and try to figure out the mechanism. Uh, but it really holds up also when we directly try to test this. So yes, those studies for the 27% was done, uh, it's a core study in humans. Now, um, the second question, if I get it right, you were asking like how a faulty ECM, like some matrix could lead to diseases. Is that correct? Yeah, basically. Or, I mean, diseases of Asia not specifically. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, you know, your organs are surrounded by a by actual matrix based by membrane, right, and keeps your tissue in check, right, basically, it's the geometry of, of the tissue, and that affects function, right, you could imagine if you just basically, your exome matrix degrades, you know, the tissue is not held properly in place, and you get tissue damage, and that could lead to, to death, it's really simple, or to infection, it's also based, it's also a barrier for infection, which was you know, early also mentioned with, with, with viruses or any other things. So um, there's so many different ways it actually can influence aging. And um, yeah, I never carefully listed all the different ways uh, you could die from a faulty ECM. <laughs> Maybe you should I do that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like an interesting <laughs> exercise. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Okay, wonderful. I think we only have one participant question left. Then uh, that leaves me with asking my foresight questions afterwards, uh, unless you stop me, guys, about asking more questions. But I'll ask the one because I'm not sure if they have access to um, uh, the mic, which is, have you looked at whether circadian disruption alters the ECM, repair, MMP, um, anything like that? Yeah, not me, but um, that has been done. And so there's a wonderful paper out there where they looked actually at um, the, ex the the tendon, right, and the circadian rhythm. So, you know, tendons, you know, the, 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 the collagen fiber bundles get thicker and thinner and thicker depending on, on the day rhythm and the collagen expression also cycles then, right? And so the, the, the idea is then to look how the circadian clock actually affects the collagen model in the extra matrix. And so um, that is start, just starting to get done. So I was at the European uh, matrix meeting. And so there are some groups that starting uh, or work on this, right? Um, and so that will come. So definitely, I think then, you know, the experiments that should be done, like blocking BMAL or something like that and see how effect, how, how what will be the effects then to, to the collagen and the extra matrix and the mechanic properties. I think those studies will come out soon. And yes, it's not, 
at least I don't know of it. Maybe it's already done, but so far I haven't seen it. And well, I, I just want to just give you one one more thing. I'm actually uh, took over um, uh, just do a little bit of advertisement. So I took up an editor job, and where where basically this is for the American Journal of Physiology. So it's not an ECM journal. That's why I liked it because I wanted to go into physiology. And basically, what I'm have a call out for extra matrix and aging. And so one of them, I'm hunting down somebody who looks at exactly circadian rhythm and extra matrix changes during aging. So if anybody's out there who wants to write a view, please um, send it to me or in any regard, extra matrix and aging, um, send it to me. And I would be, you know, I want to collect this to get a big overview about the extra matrix and the aging field. Okay, wonderful. Um, maybe, you know, uh, just to bring people like a little bit like up to speed also on like, what are you focused on a little bit like in the kind of like near term to longer term future? Like what, you know, what's kind of like next on your research agenda um, in terms of like interest, interest areas that you're interested in exploring and so forth? So, yeah, I mean, what we recently found, I mean, if you think about all these changes, like glycation end products, the stiff next to matrix, how would that actually change the cell physiology, right? And so basically what we've seen is now it's really mechanotransduction. And so we're trying to figure out now how these changes in the exome matrix, how this change mechanotransduction, and then how this changes cell identity um, in, in one way. And so we are um, working on that in that direction. At the moment, we look going more into a skin model because they're the hemidesmosomes, as I showed, and they're very well conserved in skin and they're important for skin aging because they, they, they you know, these hemidesmosomes, they hold the, the skin stem cells, um, you know, they maintain the good ones and sort out the not, not so good ones, right? And they are very like drastic diseases, these skin fragility diseases, but basically the hemidesmosomes don't work anymore and you get these blisters and easy wounding. And so, I mean, this is pretty bad, but, Basically, we're now using machine learning to design drugs to stabilize some of these hemidesmosomes, right? Because they also turned over. And the hope would be to um, strengthen then whatever the hemidesmosomes they have with the gene therapy they're given. So we could, you know, you know, you know, improve their disease. And so that's at the moment the next focus uh, to go there. Of course. This one is, uh, you know, in the phase 2A uh, study, you can go, it's an orphan disease. You can, whatever you find on, on drugs, we can then go for, you know, see whether they also affect age, aging or longevity. And I would, I would guess so. Right. Very cool. Okay. I see John hands up too. Hi, I just thought of one more question. Um, I'm aware that some researchers are looking for cross-link breakers that specifically target glucose pain but it seems that they are using uh, enzymes rather than small molecules. And I wonder if you have some thought about whether a large molecule like an enzyme could even get into the active site. I think most of their um, research is being done in uh, test tubes and not in vivo. And I wondered if you had some thoughts about steric hindrance of large molecules like enzymes, making them not very useful. Yeah, uh, I don't want to discourage that research, but you know, if you just look at the metalloproteinases, right? They fail to cleave at the right places, right? So they're trying to cleave out all these cross links part and they don't manage. So maybe you have to make a very good enzyme. And also, I mean, you know, ATP is pretty scarce in the exocellular matrix, right? And so where you get that, you know, the ATP and all these other things to, to get some of these enzymes to work, um, you know, but I'm sure once you have a prototype, you can finesse it and, and shrink it down and make it make accessible. Mm. Maybe you have to combine it with, with one or, or the other things, right? Um, but that would be definitely good. I mean, the the major problem is that usually where, so these crosses, so these collagens that are long lived, they can be 114 years in average, right? It's basically where it's acellular tissue. So you don't have cells that normally cells would remodel it, right? And so those ones are just because there's no remodeling going on. Um, so I don't know how how real to get to it. But even if you break those cross links, right, would then those collagens be again aligned properly and and you know, can can they do the job or 
the best way would be actually to to replace this in some sort, right? Um, I guess it is the fibroblast whose job it is to chew up the um, old collagen and make new collagen, and perhaps we could genetically engineer or somehow enhance the um, capability of fibroblasts and and inject them to sites that need clearing up. Have you thought of that? Um. No, that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> I thought of that one. <laughs> I, I mean, there's natural enzymes. I mean, you, you know, lysines and arginines, they, they form like a, a tripartite crosslink. And, um, you know, there's enzymes that mediate that process. So, I mean, collagen is, is sort of naturally crosslinked quite a bit at a time. It's when it's unnaturally crosslinked that may, maybe it's causing problems. But, the, but collagen does form aberrant or, you know, natural crosslinks, and there's enzymes that actually do that. Yeah, no, yeah. we want to get rid of the stuff that's that's yeah. crosslinked in a toxic or pathological yeah. way. Yeah, or it, a lot of it is whether, you know, this aberrant stuff, you know, brings about aberrant immune responses or processing or, or, or things like that, but crosslink, collagen is, is pretty heavily crosslinked, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it it has to be crossing to be yeah used. yeah yeah. If you don't get the crossing, well, you have some bad I mean, diseases. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have two minutes left, and I do yeah. want to make sure that we get uh, to the question that we always close with, which is, um, if people in this group are excited about your work, um, what could they do uh, to help? And um, you know, uh, obviously, you know, conflict of interest uh, noted. Um, but like, if there is anything you want to point to, um, you know, any specific bits for people to support or just to stay up to date. I mean, you already mentioned, you know, the, uh, the potential to like send you uh, specific research bits, but anything that you want to mention uh, in the final minute now is a great time to do so. Well, you know, I would encourage you. I like the interactions and, and talking to everybody, right? So the matrix is, to me, it's just the opening game. It's a very tough problem and it requires talking to everybody right and so i talked a lot i'm a biologist i talked to a lot of engineers and you know trying to come up with good ideas so i like that the change so if anybody wants to do stuff happy to send me an email happy to exchange ideas or move things forward and then you know there's there are lots of initiatives going on and more and more ecm gets into into the focus of aging research, right? Because starting to become tractable. And so I think more groups will, will go in there, which is fantastic. I think there are more ECM research going on and then hopefully we find some some good targets there. But, uh, you know, yeah, that that's also keep up the discussion. Wonderful, thank you. You definitely, I think, initiated uh, a great discussion here. And um, we're also still Configuring a potential workshop on this uh, topic for next year. And so for the group, uh, perhaps stay up to date. I really want to thank you from everyone in this group. Uh, I know you're already getting a few of those by, uh, by chat, but thanks a ton for joining us. Um, uh, thanks a ton for the research that you do. Uh, this was really wonderful. Um, and I'm hoping it wasn't the last time uh, that we hear from progress in this area uh, from you. And I'll be in touch with the recording for everyone. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, and yeah, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.